Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so, so much for having me, Alexa, and to the entire PDI and Early Learning Coalition team. I am really excited to be here. So I am going to share my slides so that we can begin. All right, so I, you know, I, I wanted to ground us first in, um, in why we're here, right? This is our super trauma-informed Saturday. We are going to be focusing on how we can support young children who may have already experienced some really significant adversity, some really significant hardships, and perhaps some pretty serious traumatic events in their short lives already, right? And so I think that when we think of these, um, these children in particular, our mind often goes to the, the mental health therapists, the, the folks who are really highly trained to help to heal, right? Children and families. What I want to bring to all of us today is to make that really deep and important connection that you as a teacher, um, as a caregiver in the early learning classroom with those children are one of the most important people, one of the most important relationships for those children in their lives as well, right? So you play an incredibly important role in actually helping those children be identified helping them find and connect, get connected to the services and then helping them heal as well. And so a, a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is really going to be grounded in your incredibly important role in these children's lives. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about, I think um, more so later in the day when we're talking specifically about resilience and strategies for resilience, a lot of those things are great for every child but we're always going to bring in the lens of, you know, and why is it extra important for children who may have experienced trauma already in their very short lives? So first we're gonna talk about trauma-informed care. It can be a really uh, sort of big umbrella topic and I'm going to break it down, hopefully give you a really good view of what it looks like in a classroom setting and give you um, a much better understanding of how you can actually be trauma informed in your teaching and in your caregiving with the kiddos in your class. So we are going to, um, we'll, we'll go through the presentation, we'll talk about kind of what is trauma, how does it impact the developing brain? Why are we talking about this with infants and toddlers? Um, and young children um, will really kind of dive into the importance of, of noticing um, trauma and being able to address trauma as early as a child may be experiencing it. And then I'll, um, I'll be able to have uh, some resources on the screen and some resources afterwards that I'll be able to provide as well um, for you to dive into any of this that we, that we talk about today a little deeper. So I just want to uh, introduce kind of my role. Um, Alexa mentioned, you know, that I'm the executive director of our Florida Association for Infant Mental Health. We are really proud to be our state's uh, professional association focused on our infant and early childhood mental health workforce, who is all of you. Everyone who touches the life of a young child from birth to five is part of our early mental health workforce. Because if you're, if you're spending time with babies, with toddlers, with young kids, you are actually impacting their mental health, whether you realize it or not. And so uh, the goal of FAME is really to help to promote a better understanding of what early mental health is and how we can help support good, strong, positive mental health from the earliest ages. So today um, we're gonna have kind of two objectives. I'm gonna talk about trauma-informed care and what it looks like in the classroom. And then really uh, a little bit more about the impact of trauma, really understanding why it's so important to notice and to address 
as soon as we notice that a young child may be experiencing some adversity or some traumatic experiences. So I wanna start with, with this. This is sort of the, the most foundational concept of trauma-informed care, which is that your assumption, you, you bring with you a universal expectation or a universal assumption that anyone in any program, in any classroom, in any system, no matter whether they are an employee or the client you're serving, anyone can be a trauma survivor. And understanding that young children experience trauma too. A lot of times we think that just because children can't remember the details, can't remember the who, what, when of a traumatic experience that happens in their earliest years, we think sort of thankfully, you know, they won't even notice, they won't remember, it won't even affect them. Only half of that is true. They may not remember well enough to recount the story later on or to tell you exactly how it impacted them, but they do remember. It will be ingrained in their bodies, in their stress response, and in their brains, right? So really understanding that young children do experience trauma and it can have a negative effect on them. Actually, it can have a bigger, more negative effect on younger children than it may have on, let's say, a 18-year-old, a 20-year-old, a 40-year-old. So when we're talking about trauma, we want to kind of, you know, set, set the ground with some common language. What we're talking about is an event or a circumstance that threatens your life your mental health or your physical integrity, right? And so trauma is the physical and the emotional responses to that kind of event. An event that you feel is threatening your life or your health or your safety, right? Witnessing a traumatic event that can threaten the life or the physical safety of a really close loved one can also be a traumatic experience, especially when we're talking about a young child witnessing a traumatic event happen to their primary caregiver, right? A close family member. So I also, because we are always going to take this infant mental health lens, which is always, always focused on the quality of the relationships between a caregiver and the young child, right? That the, the relationship, and you're going to hear me say this probably a dozen more times today, the relationship is the vehicle for learning, for feeling safe in the world, and for growing healthy brains, healthy bodies, and for learning, right? So we also want to notice, and when we're thinking about, when, when you're kind of thinking about that question here on the screen, reflecting maybe from your own experience in the classroom, what could an example of trauma be for an infant or a toddler? I want you to also think about the fact that losing an important relationship when you are under the age of three, under the age of five really, but especially as a baby, as a toddler, losing an important relationship can very much be a traumatic event. Because babies don't exist by themselves, right? Babies actually could not exist by themselves. They wouldn't survive. There are always babies and babies and a caregiver, babies and their important adults in their lives. Hopefully there's more than one, right? But if they lose one of those very important adults in their lives, that loss of a relationship, it, you know, it's, it's a loss of safety. It's a loss of stability. It's a loss of routine, of familiarity. And all those things make infants and young children feel threatened. 
it makes them feel that their their lives are threatened right so i want you to also think about when we think about what some of the the babies the toddlers the young children in your classrooms what kind of traumatic events may they have already experienced i want you to consider what relationships have they lost because those are really important um, important events to notice and a lot of times unless we've been trained in relationship-based care and relationship-based practice and infant mental health we don't always notice or we don't always realize how important that can be right and how impactful that can be to a child so i want to I want to kind of frame why trauma in our earliest days and months and years is so important and so different than if we were talking about uh, middle schoolers or high schoolers or coping with trauma as adults, right? And this really has to do with our brain development. I mentioned this before, this is one of our, our uh, most famous <laughs> and, and favorite quotes in the infant mental health world. I kind of alluded to it just a few minutes ago, right? There's no such thing as a baby <laughs> because they don't live by themselves. They don't exist by themselves. They don't survive by themselves. There is always a baby and someone. And so why we focus on the earliest years why we need to put our time and our attention and our investment in noticing those children who are going through trauma or adverse experiences as babies and toddlers is because the vast majority of our brain develops before the age of five. That is not to say that we cannot learn or grow or change as an older child or a teenager or an adult, right? Of course, we can always learn new things, but if any of you have tried to, let's say, learn a new language as an adult, you will notice that although it is entirely possible, it is difficult. And the reason why it is much more difficult is because our brains are already structured. We have pathways, we have networks that are connected, and it's hard <laughs> to change those pathways, those patterns of connection, once we've been building them and growing them and strengthening them for decades, right? This is also why we need to notice trauma as soon as it may happen. And we need to think about the youngest children who may have been around, who may have been impacted by that experience. Because if there's something that's making a baby, a toddler, a preschooler feel unsettled, unstable, unsafe, right? Maybe uh, a parent was just um, arrested, they don't know when they're going to see them next, right? Perhaps they're, they're going to prison for a long time. That's a loss of a relationship. That's going to make a child feel unstable and feel threatened, right? The reason why we need to care, especially about young, the youngest children, is because this is the time when they are building their brains. This is the time when they're building their pathways for how I feel in the world, how I act in the world, how I understand other people. And when I get stressed, when I feel scared and unsafe and my stress system is activated in the body, much of how we cope with that, whether we you know, can get stressed, but we have someone there to help us regulate and get calm, safe, and back into that um, kind of easy state of being. If we have that, that's wonderful. But for children who are experiencing trauma, who it hasn't even been noticed, it hasn't been identified or addressed, 
and that child's not being supported. Maybe they've lost an important relationship and they don't have any of those strong, safe, stable relationships anymore. That child is going to be, their stress system is going to be activated over and over and it's going to keep being activated and activated and activated. And when that happens, we train the brain to always be on high alert. So let's kind of go into that, right? And unpack that a little bit because it's a lot. <laughs> um, so we think of our first days, our first months, even our first couple of years as our foundation, right? So when you think about building a house, the goal is to build the foundation perfectly so that it can be strong, right? So that the concrete is completely even, there's no air bubbles that rebar is going to be perfectly aligned so that the walls that you build on top of it are going to be structurally sound, right? So we can think of, especially for those of you who may work in infant classrooms, we can think of you all as, as truly laying this foundation in those babies' brains. We are, with every interaction that we have with them, right, with every hello, with every responding to a sound that they're making, uh, with every, you know, feeding time and diaper change and every time we interact with them or every time we ignore a cue, right, or a bid for communication, we're training their brain. This is the way that the world is. This is what you should expect, right? And so it's, <laughs> sorry, it can be a really beautiful time if there's lots of caregivers around, if they are responsive, if they are, um, you know, focused on, on providing that baby exactly what they need, making sure that they are always feeling safe and comfortable and engaged, right, and taken care of that's wonderful. That creates an incredibly strong foundation for your brain. When you get agitated, you know, maybe your diaper is dirty and you don't feel very good and you cry and someone comes to you and, and they help you. They figure out your need, they change your diaper and you're feeling good, right? Or, oh, you have that rumble in your tummy, you're getting hungry, you start crying and someone comes and they realize, oh, you might be hungry here. Have this, right? Those kinds of responsive interactions and re that kind of responsive caregiving is really wonderful and builds a very solid foundation in our brains for healthy development, for readiness to learn, and for success throughout our life. But if you are a baby who, you know, feels that rumble in their tummy and you cry and cry and cry and cry and cry and cry because that's your only way of communicating that you are starving and no one comes, right? If you are a baby who is actually experiencing um, a traumatic, you know, event like abuse, you, your needs may not be being met and you're being harmed by the caregiver who should actually be protecting you and keeping you safe. That creates a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, kind of confliction. And because especially when we're talking about a baby and a very young child, they, they still need that caregiver to survive but they don't know whether their next communication attempt will be safe and they will get their need met or it might result in harm, right? That creates a brain that is always hyper aware of small changes in behavior and you know, the emotional tone of the others around them and that kind of activation in the brain that is, you know, I have a need, but I'm not sure how to communicate it safely. I don't know how to get my, my need met safely, right? Without, without triggering something awful that creates different pathways in the brain. 
that creates pathways in the brain that are always strongly connected to emotions and to our basically our, our sort of alarm system, right? As humans of like something bad's happening. I just noticed it. I got to do something to save myself, right? When that happens, we're not that open to learning. We don't take the time to say, hmm, what did I do next? What's the best path, right? When we build a brain that's constantly worried about your physical safety, then we really aren't giving that child a chance to have the experience that safety provides them, which is when children are feeling safe, they want to explore. They want to interact with people. They might even want to meet new people, right? They're interested in new people, new things, new sights, new sounds, new places. When a child and their brain is wired to be worried constantly about their safety because they never know, there's no rhyme or reason, right? They don't know what might be safe and what is not. That's not setting the foundation, right? For, for a healthy brain. That's a brain that's always on high alert. So I'm talking a lot about, you know, stress and activation. I always wanna mention that not all stress is bad. Some stress in us as humans is necessary and that's what we consider to be positive stress, right? So that's not what I'm talking about. Positive stress is, it's kind of like motivating, right? You might have like your heart rate might increase a little bit. You might have a little bit of increase in those stress hormones that the, that the body releases. It's, you know, something like you're, you're feeling nervous, you're feeling excited, right? Like I came into this presentation, I probably had a little boost of cortisol. And my heart rate was a little bit up because I'm excited and I want to do a good job, right? That, that's positive stress. It's motivating. It helps us to kind of get the job done, right? For a child, that can be like meeting a new caregiver, right? Coming into the classroom and meeting a new teacher, um, it can be that really brief stress of getting a, a, a vaccination or an immunization. Um, and it can actually also be that frustration that you see in young children when they're like really trying to do something that they can't yet actually do, right? Like that, they're trying that puzzle for the fifth time. Maybe they've gotten three out of the five pieces. They're trying so hard to figure out how it goes, but that's positive stress, right? The body will respond to that kind of challenge. Um, but that's not only is it not harmful, but it's, it's good for us. It's normal. There's also what we consider to be tolerable stress, right? And these can be, this can be in response to something truly serious, very, very serious, but what makes it tolerable is that that very negative experience, they are being supported in that experience by supportive relationships, right? So they have at least one adult there with them who is helping them feel okay, helping them feel their emotions, and kind of regulate, you know, when they're feeling really dysregulated, really stressed, really upset, there's an adult to help them come back down out of that. Because that's going to be normal, right? That's our human experience. Something sets us off, our body reacts with the whole body stress response. But what we want to happen is for us to actually kind of be able to like say, hmm, like, is this, <laughs> is this really a, a big deal, right? Do I need to have this kind of huge response or do I need to remind myself, right? And use my, my calming strategies to be okay. We're always going to be up and down, up and down. That's the human experience. But for young children, they can be resilient. They can come out of really traumatic experiences with not too much harm if 
they have a supportive, loving, protective relationship. Then there's toxic stress. And again, it has nothing to do with the situation. It's not like, you know, abuse is toxic, but uh, becoming homeless, homeless is tolerable. It is not about the event. It is not about the circumstance. The difference between whether stress impacts a child's health and well being negatively or not, the difference is that there is a person there. So, what makes really intense stress toxic, truly toxic, meaning harmful to their bodies and brains, is that they are being activated over and over and over without anyone helping, without anyone there to calm, to soothe, to give them hope that it will be okay. Right? And as you'll hear me say a lot of times today, the key is the relationships. And that is where you come in. Because ideally for humans to thrive, we should always have multiple caregivers in our lives. We should have many important adults. People who care about us, who are stable in our lives, and who are safe and help us feel safe, right? but the key is relationships. And so you all, I want you to feel the power and the importance of your role as teachers and caregivers in a classroom setting. You are part of those important adults in their lives. You can be that one safe and stable caregiver if they don't have anyone else. So if you have, um, you know, kind of looked into trainings, heard about uh, adverse childhood experiences, you've, you've probably heard of this idea of ACEs, right? So ACEs are from the research, there are 10 specific experiences that have the most negative impact on a child's development, learning and academic success and mental health, right? Physical and mental health. And so when, let's see, about 25 years ago, <laughs> when people actually really started diving into research around the ACEs, they were shocked at the very strong connection between children who had experienced these adverse childhood experiences, right? These traumatic experiences and some really negative health outcomes, mental health outcomes and learning outcomes. So to give you a view of what these 10 things are, these adverse childhood experiences, they include uh, different forms of abuse, different forms of neglect, physical and emotional. And it also has to do with what they call household dysfunction. So an experience that may not have happened directly to the child, but is happening to their caregiver, right? It's happening to their primary caregiver, usually. So that's someone in the home who is suffering from untreated mental illness. Uh, that is someone who's struggling with substance abuse issues. Um, someone who is incarcerated or perhaps they lost a parent from death or divorce or abandonment. And it's also witnessing domestic violence against a parent, right? So these are all 10 very well-documented traumatic experiences for, for infants and young children that we know 
are linked to poor health behaviors, poor health outcomes, chronic health conditions, things that, you know, the, the folks in the medical world had no idea would be so strongly linked to things like diabetes, um, hypertension, all kinds of health problems, right? And so what we also want to hold in mind when we're thinking about children who may have experienced trauma is that we're not just helping them now, right? We're not, we, we're not just helping them maybe get out of an abusive experience right now. We are also helping them for the rest of their lives because experiencing these things will change their brain and changing your brain changes the way that our body works. And so by addressing these things, by helping children to be uh, identified and you know, get that help, that support and that treatment that they need early is gonna be so impactful, not just to them right now in the moment, but for their entire lives. I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the 10 ACEs that we, um, <clears throat> that we've studied a lot. There's really clear evidence that they are extremely harmful to young children. Um, <clears throat> those are, are the kind of the, the adverse childhood experiences that are up above the ground around the tree, but there are also what we call adverse community environments. Right, so living in poverty, experiencing discrimination, community disruption, not having access to quality housing, experiencing community violence. All of these things are considered community level ACEs, right? And so even though they're not impacting necessarily uh, a child or their caregiver really directly in that relationship, these are things that impact children's and families' lives. And they can have a negative impact on physical health, mental health, and overall well being and success, right? So there's lots of, of research on the outcomes when a child has one or some or many ACEs. And you can see many of them here. But the one that I really wanna highlight is that one sort of on the top that's pointing right to his brain, reduces the ability to respond, learn, or figure things out which can result in problems in school. So when our brain is activated with stress, right? Our stress, something happens, we feel threatened, our body responds immediately. It's part of our human nature. It is actually built to keep us alive. Technically our stress response is a wonderful thing. It can get us out of life-threatening situations. But what it also does to the brain is it reduces the blood flow to the parts of the brain that help us think, plan, evaluate. Hmm, should I do this? What if I do that? What would happen if, and learn. And so a brain that is constantly activated, right? Because there's a person who's unsafe, a situation that's unsafe, a brain that, and a body that's constantly activated by stress, especially over time, their brain is not a brain that's gonna be ready to learn. Their brain is going to be focused on keeping them safe and alive because that is the one thing that we, <laughs> that, that our bodies and brains are made for. 
all humans. <laughs> the ultimate goal is just to stay safe so that we can stay alive. And so if we're constantly activated in that state, if we're constantly feeling unsafe, if we're constantly monitoring whether we are safe, our brain is not in the state where we can be curious, where we can feel safe enough to explore and wonder. And that's how learning happens. So I also want to make that connection between what can look like attention problems, right? Young children have very, very short attention spans to begin with. That's why knowing <laughs> what is kind of developmentally expected of whatever age of children you're working with is so important, right? Because if you had been always working in the pre-K room and all of a sudden you moved to the toddler room and you were like, why can't these toddlers sit and do anything, <laughs> right? Always knowing what is the typical expectation of the ages and, and not even beyond the ages, the developmental level of the children in your class is so, so important so that you have correct expectations from the get-go. But when you notice that there may be a child or a few or many who even for their age and what you would expect are really not able to sit and do pay attention for long enough to do what other folk, you know, what the other kids are doing. If you're noticing really different levels of attention, I want to highlight that that can be due to trauma. And that is one of the biggest things that we miss, right? We're so aware of, um, I think, the, the different ways that brains can be, which is a wonderful thing but we don't always consider one of the biggest reasons for inattention and impulsivity, which is that that child has experienced trauma and these are the effects of that trauma. So I want you to have that in your toolbox as well, right? That should always be a wondering rather than, you know, I think this child has ADHD, go refer them for service, refer for testing, for Referring to specialists is wonderful. <laughs> Continue to do that. But I do want you to also notice that some of the hallmark behaviors of trauma are not being able to pay attention and being impulsive, right? And so we'll talk a little bit more about, about kind of how and why. I think this is a really nice, these next two slides are a really nice way of kind of visualizing the, the difference in brains that are feeling safe. You know, they're kind of in that just like balanced state, feeling okay, feeling fine. This is how a brain processes, right? First we observe something, we interpret it, kind of like give a judgment of like good, bad. Uh, we process the information. Then we can evaluate our options, right? We can say like, oh, well, he's over there in the block area, but he's over there in, you know, like painting. What, what can I do, right? Like my one friend's there, I wanna be with them, but I really like painting. When you're feeling safe, your brain can take time, right? You evaluate your options, you make a plan, and then you decide, then you do it. Notice how a lot of the, the, the really great planning, uh, ways of planning and ways, ways of helping children plan um, are kind of mapped out in this process as well, right? But what happens when a child has been uh, kind of conditioned based on their experience, right? Maybe they've experienced a lot of uh, abuse in their life. They are in a new classroom. They don't know if the adults are safe or not safe. And their brains are going to go on a different path because of the way that their brain has been formed. 
with those experiences over and over and over again. Of I observe something, I interpret it, it's either safe or unsafe. And if it's safe, boom, I go straight to acting. When your life is feeling threatened, our brain makes it so that we do not stand around and think, right? Like if we were walking in the woods and we came upon a giant 10 foot bear, turn the corner, there he is. He's huge, he's terrifying, he's ready to attack you. We don't have time for our thinking brain to say, oh, wow, that bear is humongous. It probably weighs 2,000 pounds. His teeth are sharp. He has claws. He is definitely going to eat me. So what are my, what's my best like option here? Should I like climb the tree? Should I run down that ravine? You don't have time for that. <laughs> and our bodies and our brains have been built over thousands of years to know that because that's how it keeps us safe and alive. So when we turn the corner and we see the bear, our brain, a thinking brain, the blood gets pulled away from it. So it's not gonna work. All the blood goes to a, the back of our brain, which is our kind of emotion center, our alert center. And we are just gonna do, like we do not think, we do to save our lives. This is the same stress response that is activated when a child thinks that their life is threatened, even if it's not. So that's another thing that you need to notice is that for children who have experienced ACEs, for children who have experienced trauma and have spent many minutes, hours, days of their lives already, in that stress activation that, oh my God, this is unsafe, gotta act to save my life. Oh my God, gotta act. Oh my God, gotta save myself, right? In that super quick, you judge something's unsafe, you do something, right? You either run, you freeze. Those are basically what, what we do, <laughs> right? Those are our kind of natural survival instincts. When you have a child who has, has created those pathways in the brain, who has created this express route to save yourself, they're also going to see threat when it might not even be there. So that means right? We, and we know this, there's lots of brain research that shows this, that children who experience abuse, especially at the youngest ages, their brains are wired so that they see things that another child who has not been abused might see as neutral, not threatening. They see those things as threatening right? It can be a facial expression. We know that children who have experienced ACEs are hyper aware of tiny changes in facial expression. And we've also seen from that research that just kind of a, a neutral face of an adult, those children interpret as a mean face or a mad face, that they're upset. That's because their brains are wired to pay attention to threat, they actually start to see it in places where it is not even. So that's why you may see this in the classroom. You may see this express route. If we don't have the lens of trauma, we might not even realize it. We might not even realize that that's what this is. We might just say, oh, he's, you know, he's just super quick to act out. He's just super impulsive, can't control anything, can't control himself, can't control the emotions, can't. We might not realize the why behind the behavior. So I invite you to think about this. <laughs> um, the next time you're wondering about a child's behavior, 
right? Especially a behavior that is challenging us, that is that, that feels like it's getting out of control or feels kind of out of nowhere, right? Sometimes a child might interpret a trigger where you would see none and every other child is fine. That one child who's experienced trauma in their life might have seen or felt a trigger and they're on that express route to saving themselves. Right. So I also wanna talk a tiny bit about how this impacts our development, right? So. Uh, I feel like I kind of framed it just now around what kind of behaviors you would see, but this is especially important to you all as early learning educators because experiencing ACEs, experiencing toxic stress actually harms a child's development. The research that they've done with comparing ACEs to children with a diagnosis of developmental delay, what they've found is that a child with an ACE score of six or seven, 90 to 100% of those children have been diagnosed with a developmental delay. Let me say that again. Children who have experienced six or more of those adverse childhood experiences, almost every single one of them have been so negatively impacted by it that they are showing a developmental delay. This is also really important information for you all to know, right? It does not mean that, that trauma is the cause of all children's developmental delay, but there is a really strong relationship there. And so, you know, this, this kind of image here is reminding us that this is a body system, right? Toxic stress harms the brain. The brain controls our body. And so when the brain is in that state of stress activation, not only is it pulling the blood away from our thinking brain and back to our reacting brain, but it's also changing how we, you know, how our, our heart works, how our lungs work, our circulation, our digestion, and our immune system, right? Because the brain is getting the whole body ready to fight off the threat or just freeze and, you know, play dead and let it go away to save your life. The whole body is ready for a fight or ready to like lay down and protect yourself every time our stress response goes off. And so that not only impacts our health, but it impacts our actual development in all the developmental domains when we're talking about young children language, motor, cognition, all of our domains, right? Of course, the social, emotional, and early mental health, all of these things are harmed and the relationship is really strong. Another reason to intervene early. So I want to pause here because uh, this is this is where we're going to move now <laughs> into the um, kind of the the next piece of what this can look like and what you can do, right? Um, how to build a trauma informed classroom. So I just want to offer <laughs> these reflections. <laughs> I'm curious what has surprised you about anything that I've shared today so far and anything that you might change knowing this information about trauma and toxic stress. I'm gonna pull up the chat 
so I can see it too. Feel free to put in the chat. What, what surprised you? Did anything really stand out to you? What are, you know, some kind of, I don't know, takeaways? Um, and what might you change? And even if you're not able to write in the chat, I would invite you to take just a moment to think about it, maybe write it down, jot it down somewhere, maybe even in the notes section of your phone. Anything surprise you? Mm. Yeah, Ada shared maybe something that surprised you, right? The impact of how severely a child gets affected was a sobering moment. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, part of our mission at FAME, and hopefully it becomes part of everyone's mission who we uh, teach and educate and support is, is really changing people's minds about babies and young children and helping them understand that they are learning <laughs> at a more rapid pace in those first months than we will ever learn before, right? But what they're learning about is about people, <laughs> about themselves, about others, about how to be in the world, how to trust in the world. So we don't notice oftentimes what a big impact our experiences have on very young children, but it really does. Yeah. 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 Uh, and there's a comment too. I'm very surprised that they can have stress and feel stressful so young. Absolutely. Stress is a, it's a body and a brain response. All humans have stress. <laughs> we were, we were made to react that way, right? To save our lives. But a lot of times we react with our life-saving response, even when we don't need to, right? When, when we're not actually threatened and that can be really exhausting for our bodies and our brains. <clears throat> yes. And I love this one. How important the environment, but then in the parentheses, people <laughs> of a child around that child, yeah, can affect their brain. That's right. A lot of times we talk about the environment around a child. And when we hear environment, we tend to think like what this what the place looks like, <laughs> right? Or where they are about the physical location. But when, when the most important environment around a child are the people and the relationships. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Oh, and here's a good one too. Veronica shares she was surprised how past experiences affect present behaviors and reactions. Yes. And the, real, the reason that's such a strong pattern in young children is because every experience they have is shaping their brain, is shaping how they're going to react in the future to new and different experiences, right? Yeah. And yes, the really strong correlation between trauma and developmental delay. <clears throat> I think for the physicians when they were studying ACEs, they were all shocked and blown away by the very strong relationship to all kinds of chronic conditions that we have as adults, right? Things that, that so many Americans are suffering from, everyone's like, how can we help? How can we reduce these rates? And then they looked at the correlation between people having ACEs early in life and having those things. And that was a real eye opener for the medical world. 
And I think that the correlation, the relationship between ACEs and developmental delay should be just as shocking to all of us as early educators. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Because it's it's not just about getting them out of a, a dangerous situation, right? If a child's experiencing one of those ACEs right now, and you find out, you realize somehow, right, through your relationship with the family or some other way, you want to get that child out of that experience. But you're also helping to protect them and helping their, you know, protect their health, their mental health, and their learning for the rest of their lives as well. It's a really, really big impact you have. All right. Thank you so much for these reflections. I appreciate that. All right. We're going to move into, oops, <clears throat> into the next um, uh, kind of section of, of our time today, right? So thinking about trauma-informed care. One of the most important realizations, or hmm, let's say awareness that you can have, is about the fact that all behavior has a reason. There is a story behind it, right? And so this is one of our, our favorite quotes to share is that, you know, everyone in the classroom has a story that can lead to misbehavior or defiance. Nine times out of 10, that story behind the child's misbehavior won't make you angry. It will break your heart. That is having a trauma-informed lens that is understanding that there is a reason why children show these behaviors. And it may not be, you know, the behavior you want to see. It may be really disruptive. It may be really challenging, <clears throat> not just to you, but to the other kids in the class. But most times, the story behind why that child is doing that comes from a traumatic experience. It comes from an unmet need, right? And so that's always our invitation in being trauma-informed in your classroom. The easiest, simplest thing you can do is to not assume, is to wonder. So when we talk about trauma-informed care, right? What we mean is that we are looking at the care that we're giving or the services, right? Whatever we're providing to others, we're holding an understanding that problematic behaviors may need to be understood as a result of trauma. Rather than assuming that they were willful acts of defiance that need to be punished. That's the difference. When you are holding a trauma-informed lens with young children in a classroom, you are seeing that challenging behavior, but instead of labeling it as that's just how they are, how that kid is, right? They're just always like that. In, or, you know, instead of assuming like, how dare you do that to me? <laughs> <clears throat> instead of assuming that that misbehavior was on purpose and just to make you angry and needs to be punished, we instead come at it with an understanding that it's coming from an unmet need. The child is trying to communicate something to us. And this is the way they're communicating it, right? We wish that every child could say, I'm feeling really lonely. 
and I don't know what to do and I'm feeling really lost, <laughs> right? We wish that every child could just explain exactly how they're feeling and then what they need so that we can meet their needs. That is not how young children work. <laughs> so coming at <clears throat> educating and caregiving young children with a trauma-informed lens means that you are looking at problem behavior, challenging behavior, misbehavior as with an understanding, right? With a wondering, what do you need? What are you trying to communicate? And what has happened to you instead of what's wrong with you, right? <clears throat> so trauma-informed care is about understanding that challenges or unwanted behaviors are not intentional and they may be a reaction due to trauma. They are not intentional and they require a more caring and compassionate response. Right? So I also have seen this kind of shift recently in the early care and education world from, you know, we, we used to, <laughs> I feel like we used to call them problem behaviors a lot. Then they turned into challenging behaviors. And now I've seen a lot more talk about recognizing that it's a behavior that challenges me, the adult, right? <laughs> That's a behavior that challenges me, the teacher. So it's, it's this interesting shift of responsibility, right? It's like that child and his challenging behaviors. It sounds like the challenge is with him, but the challenge is not with him. And especially if you take a trauma-informed lens, it is a behavior. It just is. It is the way that they're trying to communicate. It's the way that they're trying to get a need met. And it's challenging me <laughs> a lot, right? So you feel how that's really different? That's also taking a trauma-informed lens. <clears throat> All right, so what does this look like in the classroom, right? This, these, these are kind of the, the five big sort of strategies that I can, can offer you, right? I'll, I've given you the sort of the understanding, right? The way of changing your mind about behaviors that challenge you. But this is now what you can do and what it looks like in a classroom, okay? So number one, <laughs> it's about us. Remember, behaviors that challenge us. <laughs> it's our job to regulate our emotions and come back down out of your stress activated state because the young children in your care need you to co-regulate them. Let me say that again. <laughs> the reason why regulating your own emotions is so important when a child is getting dysregulated, out of control, it's so important, number one, to realize that he's not doing this to annoy you, to make your life miserable, to, you know, he's having a hard time. But if you're going to help him regulate, that's what co-regulation is, right? Young children need to learn how to switch out of that stress activation and back into a calm state, they need adults to do that. Children do not do it alone. They do not learn to regulate by themselves, especially babies and toddlers. They learn healthy regulation by adults helping them regulate, right? Helping them notice how they feel, notice their emotions, notice the behaviors, and help them calm and soothe. 
the reason why it's important for us as adults to stay calm and not get all escalated when the kids are escalated is because the kids need you to co-regulate. If you are both activated, there will not be very effective calming or very effective co-regulation. The next strategy is to be attuned to the class. Attunement is a word that we use a lot in infant mental health. It means that you are paying attention to body language, to nonverbal cues, and also the emotional tone in the room or of individual kids, right? Being attuned can help you figure out how a child is feeling, even when they're not able to communicate it to you or how they might be affected by the environment. Being attuned and paying attention and noticing cues is really important if you are in an infant classroom. This is how we give responsive caregiving, right? How we are attentive, and responsive to babies. We have to pay attention, careful attention to them. And we have to notice their cues because their cues are small, right? Their cues may be subtle. You might know when a three-year-old's hungry because they can run up to you and be like, I'm so hungry, when is lunch time? but you need to pay close attention to mouth cues, right? To what the tongue is doing, to whether they're turning their head and rooting in an infant, especially one that's not mobile, right? So you really need to be kind of attuned to the child to know what they need and how they're being impacted by what's going on and really attuned to the classroom, right? That's kind of like the emotional tone. You can, you can tell how, how a room feels. So this is the invitation to notice cues. Being present sounds so simple, but it's not always that easy. So being present, the invitation here is to focus your attention on what children are doing in the moment, right? So instead of talking to them while doing something, you know, prepping another thing while talking about what you're going to do in the afternoon after lunch, that's not being in the present moment. But young children are always in the present moment, especially if they have not experienced trauma. We are naturally as humans, very focused on what's here in the here and now. And we're gonna have a, a, you know, a lovely mindfulness strategy session after this. It's, it's about focusing on the present because that's what we have, right? The future hasn't happened. The past is over, can't change it, no matter how much you think about it or wish you could. Our life is in the present moment and young children are very much in the present moment. And so one of the best ways to be trauma-informed is to help be there with children. Because what you'll see too is that children who have experienced ACEs, their minds do tend to go into the future a lot. Worry, anxiety, because their brain is trained to keep them safe. And their brain knows that they are not safe in a lot of situations, right? So what you can do for, for all children, <laughs> but especially for children who have experienced trauma, is when you notice they're starting to get activated, when you notice that something might have just set them off, right? And they're starting to escalate. 
help them be in the present moment. With kids, it has to do with your senses, right? So give them a, a big, strong hug. That sense of being kind of held, right? Like full body hold is really powerful <laughs> in deactivating the stress response system. Have them focus on something they can smell. What kind of sounds do you hear, right? Helping children get back into the present moment is absolutely one of the things that you can do to help them feel safe. Because especially for children who have experienced trauma, if they're constantly scanning, right? Constantly monitoring, constantly being hyper vigilant about anything that might be unsafe. Helping to show them that I'm here, your friends are here, and we're all okay. Is gonna give them that regulation, right? That, that co-regulation. It'll help them to know that when they're with you, when they're in this space, they are safe. And hopefully it can sort of deregulate that stress response so that they can be open to exploring and learning and building those strong relationships with everybody else in the class. Predictable is another really important trauma-informed care practice. Notice that this says structured routine, not schedule. <laughs> right? So I always want to make, make the distinction. Schedules are by time. <laughs> Children do not follow schedules by time well, right? If we are going to be responsive caregivers, we want to do things and allow children to do things on their own time to whatever extent possible, right? What this says is a structured routine. So this just means that maybe we do the same things in the same order. It's especially important in transitions in the day. This photo sort of represents the, you know, your, your drop-off routines from parent to caregiver in the classroom. There can be routines around everything. And I would encourage you, if you know you have some children in your classroom who have experienced trauma, if you're already there, you already know, as much routine as possible will help them feel safe. Because routine is predictable. When you know what's going to happen next, you can feel safe. It's the same for adults. That's why we don't like change. We don't like <laughs> new things, right? We like it when things are routine because it's predictable and it actually helps us feel safe. <laughs> it's the same for adults, but it's even more important to have in a setting with children who have already experienced trauma, right? So routines around, around drop-off, um, around welcoming, around being together, around feeding, diapering, potty learning time, routines around everything, right? And so it's it's not important that it's like super rigid, this must happen at 12, this must happen at two. But what's important is if you have that like, you know, three-step process to saying goodbye to your parent and handing them off, to, you know, to me as the teacher every day that you do that and you do it all the time so that kids know, even if they're upset, they don't want to go, they're, you know, sad and crying and they don't want their caregiver to leave. At least having that routine still can give them some stability and structure. Stability and structure helps us feel safe, right? So we're always considering how not to reactivate those children's stress systems with something little, right? So predictability and routines is really important. This is another really important one for us to remember the adults in this equation. 
So I call this beginning new, right? And this is about sort of two things. One, we already talked about in the very first strategy of trying to stay calm when the child is activated, right? Is to try not to let children's emotions escalate our emotions. And notice when you're having those emotions, notice how you're experiencing the situation, right? Take a pause. Notice if your reaction is contributing to the calming or to further escalating. And I think it's important here too to notice that we're not sort of labeling. Here goes again. This happens all the time, right? And, and assuming that this experience is going to be just like all the others, just as hard as all the others, right? I invite you to try to keep that, you know, begin, begin new. <laughs> this is a new experience. This is a new moment. Even if it feels like it's the 10 millionth time, this child has had a meltdown about the same thing, right? Recognize your role and try to begin new, right? What does this child need? How can I contribute to the calming? And when you keep that lens, you give yourself a little distance, right? So that you don't get caught up in the big emotions as well. <laughs> so again, how we help all children, but especially children who have experienced trauma is through strong, caring, loving relationships because that shields children from the impact of negative experiences. <laughs> Even if you don't know what to do in the moment, remember what is actually important. The best way to support a child <laughs> is by being there with them. <laughs> Give me a moment, I'm gonna drink water. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry about that. So even when you don't know what to do, right? Hopefully you'll remember some of the strategies <clears throat> that I just talked about, but beyond the doing, it's the being that is most important. In infant mental health, we have another favorite quote. <laughs> by one of our uh, founding mothers of infant mental health, Jerry Paul, which is, it is as important how you are as what you do. Right? So how we are with young children is just as important as what we are doing. I would argue more important. <laughs> we need to be fully present with them. We need to be always curious as to what this behavior means. <clears throat> Sometimes it's really clear. A child will come up to you. Maybe they're looking a little sad. And they'll just come up and hug you. Right? That's pretty clear. They're feeling a little down. They want a hug. They want some comfort. That was a pretty clear communication, right? <clears throat> but sometimes, especially with children who've experienced trauma, the behaviors that they show and how it's connected to their need is not very clear. 
they're reacting in the way that makes the most sense to them, that is most accessible to them. And when their brains are constantly activated by stress, they don't have the capacity to do a lot of thinking about, you know, how they might go get some cuddles if cuddles is what they feel like they need. They might not even realize that what they need is cuddles from an adult. They might not even connect that, right? <clears throat> Because those pathways in the brain, instead of being built with like, oh, I feel a little sad or I feel a little worried, I'm going to go to my safe and trusted adult, right? That's a very easy connection for a child who has an experienced trauma. If something scares <clears throat> a child, they're typically developing, they have a secure attachment with that parent, they feel scared, they run to their parent, oh, they feel safe with their parent. They're okay again. They're going to go out and explore. They're going to go play. Then they get scared again by something. They run back to their parent. <sighs> okay, I'm good now, right? Sometimes it's as easy and as quick as that. But for a chi child who has experienced trauma, it is not always that automatic. You may not have a person to go back to. The person who you go back to might be very different right, and may react to you differently and behave differently around you, depending on things that you have no understanding of, right? Or that same parent who is responsible for giving you that love and that care and that safety and security also sometimes hurts you. And that's really confusing for a young child because we have a biological drive to go to the person who is caring for us and keeping us alive and keeping us safe. But that child's also learning that that person's not always safe and sometimes harms. And so that creates a lot of behavior that can look confusing if you don't know what's going on. Right. And so especially for those children, they still need a lot of love, a lot of cuddles, a lot of safety and security and feeling OK in the world. But they don't always show the behaviors that make it easy to do that. Right. They might be the kids who get completely out of control and pull things off shelves and throw things around and scream and yell and just get, you know, show, show a behavior that looks just completely angry, out of control, dysregulated. And those are not always the moments that we want to go up to a child and give them a big hug and hold them. But a lot of times that's what they need. So having that trauma-informed lens is very much about <clears throat> giving yourself a little distance from the experience, right? They're not doing this because they are bad. They're not doing this because of, <laughs> they're trying to <laughs> make you miserable. <laughs> they're not trying to do this to annoy you. They're not trying to do this because this is just how they are. They're doing it because they have a need that has not been met and this is the only way they have of communicating it to us, right? So that trauma-informed lens is wondering what that need is and how you can help. And sometimes how you can help is just by being there being fully present with the child, being there through all the throwing and the yelling and the screaming and the anger and still being there afterwards, right? Having them know that you're not going to go away just because they had an outburst, they had some big feelings and you're still here. You're 
helping them regulate, you're helping them kind of come back down out of that state and you're still there with them, right? And you're going to help figure out what they need. <clears throat> it sounds really simple. It is not always easy because we have the tendency to get reactive, right? When kids are reacting. But when you hold that lens of this child is suffering, I wonder why and what I can do, then it really changes the feel, right? It kind of separates you just a little bit from the experience and it allows you to have that, to hold that view of yourself as, as the helper, right? Because just as much as you're there to, uh, to teach <laughs> all of those very important school readiness um, skills, you're also there to help build strong brains and healthy emotions <laughs> and healthy stress response systems, whether you realize it or not. <laughs> that is definitely what you're doing. And so always remember the power that your relationship with that child is, right, and can have in their life. All right, so I want to have a little bit of, of time to offer reflections in the chat as we wrap up. I want to hear from you. What's really resonated with you? How might you be more trauma informed now that you've kind of heard the, the change in lens that you can hold, right? That understanding you can hold and some of the ways that you can be with children, right? Remembering that our way of being is sometimes just as important as what we are doing. So I'm going to pull up the chat again. <clears throat> Feel free to share. So what do you see in your classroom right now, right? Did you see any of those strategies, things that you are already doing, already working on? Are there some things that you want to start doing as a trauma-informed teacher? <clears throat> yeah, Danielle shared, not emotionally reacting to those extreme behaviors trying to keep calm for the sake of the child. That is a beautiful way of saying it. Trying to keep calm for the sake of the child. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. <laughs> Regulating our own emotions is hard. I'm not gonna tell you it's easy. <clears throat> That's actually why that you'll see, and you know, we and so many other people are offering classes and experiences and practice groups to actually help us all practice those things, right? <laughs> How we can regulate our own selves better um, because it's difficult for adults. And when you are in a classroom full of children who might be <sighs> triggering you in all kinds of different ways, <laughs> It's something that you need to exercise constantly throughout the day. And that can be exhausting, right? That's part of the kind of emotional energy that it is to be a teacher of young child, young children. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot about noticing our emotions. And Adriana will talk to us a lot more about that and we'll have some chance to practice. Um, 
because beyond, you know, trying to, to control our emotions, trying to control things is, is kind of hard. <clears throat> we, we generally don't do a good job of just telling ourselves like, stop reacting that way. And then magically we do. No, that doesn't really happen, right? We, we first have to notice Woo, it's happening. <laughs> I am super activated right now, right? And then you get to choose what you do next, right? So if you notice, then you get to choose how you're going to regulate yourself to better serve children, <clears throat> right? But it's the process of noticing and choosing, noticing and choosing. And yes, Muriel, thank you. She shared the importance of being present and being attuned to the child. Yeah, yeah. And, and being able to, you know, ground that child in the present moment is a really, really important piece, uh, especially for children who have already experienced trauma in their young life. <clears throat> yeah. And yes, I noticed that Gladys said, um, also including moments of relaxation within your routines, right? So if you build those routines, because routines are really, um, really helpful, really grounding, you know, help children feel safe and secure when they know what's happening, and you can build in little mindful moments, right? moments uh, where you practice, you know, breathing, or you practice those calming strategies. And that can be really powerful too, because that gives you and the children a beautiful way of, of practicing those things when it's easy to practice those things, right? So that when maybe you're in the middle of, you know, everybody being activated and everybody's stress response is going off, it might also be easier for you to say, hold on, let's practice this thing, right? This thing that we always do before lunchtime, let's go there, right? <laughs> and so a lot of times, yeah, if you can build those into your relationships, you can do that. <clears throat> I love this so much, so many great, great things shared here. Yeah, prioritizing, creating safe and supportive environments, actively listening to their experiences, validating their emotions, and tailoring interventions to their specific needs. Yes, if we could do all of that for every child, oh my goodness, they would be so well served. Yeah, 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 and someone else shared too that they never really thought that that misbehavior or that acting out could be um, a trauma response. Right. We, we tend to think it's like, oh, they don't want they don't want to hear the word. No, uh, they just always act out right They're They're just that way. Yeah, that's a lot of um, stories that we often tell ourselves about children. Yeah. Wow. Yep. I love this that David shared, too. Do not judge. Try to understand the reason for the behavior. Help the child with love and have a positive approach. That do not judge is a really important piece. And I think that Adriana will, will uh, speak a little bit more to that, but that is a really important thing for us to remember as adults because our minds are built to judge good or bad, do I want more of this, less of that? Do I always want it to be like this? And I never want it to be like that, right? Those are all judgments that make our life very hard because never never will you have a classroom that is perfectly quiet all the time where all the children are little angels happily. That's not how humans work. <laughs> yeah, so just being able to notice without judging that child as bad, that even that behavior as bad, right? It may be challenging us, but it's here for a reason. And that child needs something. <clears throat> yeah. Oh my goodness. Thank you so, so much for sharing. There is so much in the chat. 
<laughs> I could not possibly uh, review all of it. I, I am going to actually go back through this afterwards because these are beautiful reflections. And, and yeah, in the present moment, it's perfect. Thank you so, so much, everybody, for being here. I think, I think we're at time. <laughs>